Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Glory to you, Lord God of our ancestors. You are worthy of praise. Glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple, on the throne of your majesty. Glory to you. Glory to you seated between the cherubim we will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you, beholding the depths in the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us to be so joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is a reading from the book of Kings. The Lord said to Elijah, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. You shall also, you shall anoint Jehu son of Nimshi as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elijah son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elijah, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. 
he left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow him. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he bo boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. God. Let's read the response by, by half verse. Protect me, O God, for I, have take, for I take refuge in you. All my delight is upon the, the godly that are in the land. But those who run after other gods, their libations of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. You. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body shall, shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Galatians. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summoned up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposite to, to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. 
As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my house. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Please be seated. A friend of mine has been on pilgrimage for the last few weeks. She's been walking the legendary pilgrim road to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. The route begins in the Pyrenees, actually in in the French side of the Pyrenees, and ends at the Cathedral of St. James the Great, who is in Spanish Santiago, the patron saint of Spain. She's been logging at each day's travels in words and pictures and posting them on Facebook when she's been in a place with internet access. So I've been following avidly and looking at her pictures every day. In fact, I think she might have reached the cathedral, she might have reached Compostela yesterday. Pilgrimage is a journey to a holy place. It's a traditional spiritual practice that we find across many religions. The hope is that by going on pilgrimage, a person will grow deeper in faith and in relationship to God. The journey itself is as important as the place that you want to arrive at. And it also, it often involves a great deal of sacrifice. My friend has been walking, depending on the day, somewhere between 8 and 15 miles a day. Now I've had several friends who have walked the entire route to, the, to Santiago, It's called the Way of St. James, or for short, the Camino. Camino just being the Spanish word for way. Now this pilgrimage route has been popular since the Middle Ages, but its popularity has really skyrocketed in the last few years. Now not everyone who walks it is a traditionally religious person, but all the pilgrims share a common purpose. They're seeking something. They're seeking wholeness sacred space within themselves, a better understanding of their identity and their purpose in this world, and perhaps to mark a milestone where they're leaving a part of life behind and moving into a new phase. In Christian language, we could say that they're seeking a greater relationship with God and a better understanding of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The conditions on the Camino are often rustic. People stay mostly in hostels. Um, Modern conveniences are at a minimum. Uh, These hostels have, you know, shared bathrooms. Uh, And there's natural limitations, of course, to how much you can carry as you walk. It all depends on how heavy you want your backpack to be. And that's all part of the pilgrimage experience. Pilgrims step out of their comfort zone deliberately to clear their heads and to clear their spirits of distractions so that they can better experience being part of something greater than themselves. Now Jesus and disciples, have, Jesus and his disciples have begun a pilgrimage in this morning's gospel. They're traveling to Jerusalem, to the temple there. The Torah records that God commanded the Israelites to travel to Jerusalem three times a year, one of them being Passover. Now, in Jesus' time, uh, most people in Galilee traveled to the temple at least just once, usually, at Passover. 
I mean, they couldn't, they were agricultural folks and they couldn't leave their, uh, their land uh, three times a year. So the pilgrimage that Jesus and his disciples embark on in today's gospel is a long period of Luke's gospel. It takes up about 35% of Luke's gospel. And so it's a kind of travel log. The chapters here, from here to chapter 19, are basically a travel log. He's traveling to the city of those that he knows oppose him, and he's already predicted twice that when he gets there, he'll be put to death. So looking at what happens along the way is far more meaningful if we put it into that context. In today's reading, four events are mentioned. First of all, Jesus is traveling through Samaria. Now, this is really unusual. Galilees, who are on pilgrimage to the holy city, take a well-known detour around Samaria. They cross the Jordan, they go south for a while on the other side of the Jordan, and then come back in when they reach uh, the boundary of Judea. Um, because Samaritans don't believe that the temple is a legitimate place of worship. That's the crux of the whole discussion between, the, between Galileans, Judeans, and the Samaritans. The Samaritans believe that they have the one true temple on Mount Moriah. So they're very hostile to people who are traveling to Jerusalem to worship. They don't, and so they don't um, offer hospitality to Jesus and the disciples, and this is a really big deal. I mean, at the time, you know, there's no holiday inns by the side of the road or re rest stops or anything like that. So refusing hospitality to someone is a pretty big insult because some really bad things can happen to them as a result of not finding hospitality. So James and John suggest a very Old Testament solution, very old school. Basically, calling down fire from heaven, just as Elijah did centuries before to the false prophets of Baal. Okay, so the James and John want to kick it old school. But Jesus rebukes them. The same word that is used when Jesus talks to demons. Jesus rebukes them. Very strong word. And they keep going. Then three Samaritans either ask or are invited to follow Jesus. But it doesn't work out. Because they're not willing to make the sacrifices involved. The sacrifice of being a wanderer. Now we may, have, we may find this difficult to understand. Taking time to bury your father Taking time to say goodbye to your family? That sounds pretty legitimate. That sounds like a pretty legitimate reason. But Jesus is making a bigger point. All four of these events have something in common. They're all connected to Israelite cultural practices. The enmity between the Israelites and Samaritans is many centuries old, and it's mutual, as I said. The action that James and John uh, are suggesting is reserved for pagans in the Old Testament. And so by, by extension, they're calling the Samaritans pagans. Now, the other three encounters have to do with the demands of kinship. In the ancient Near East, those demands are absolute. Absolute. They cannot be avoided, shirked for any reason. There's no individual identity in the ancient Near East. Your identity comes from your family. There's no sense of, oh, you know, I have to do what I need to do for self-realization. Uh, no, absolutely not. There's no, there's no idea of that at all. The proper way to live is to obey the cultural practices with respect to your family. And so each of the three uh, who are would-be disciples face becoming a non-person if they go through with following Jesus. And that's a very high price to pay. 
their family doesn't approve, they basically cast them out and say, you're not, you know, you're not my son anymore. You're not my brother anymore. You're not my grandson anymore. So that's a pretty high price. So Jesus' point, which he makes in a pretty harsh way, <laughs> is this. Nothing comes before God. Nothing. Not even the cultural demands that are considered absolute. Now, we are on a pilgrimage ourselves. Our very lives are a pilgrimage. Now, we have more choices for self-expression and fulfillment than the people in Jesus' time because we have a well-developed, perhaps sometimes too developed, sense of the individual. But the point of the reading still applies to us. Do we truly value God above all else? Now, from the Christian viewpoint, that's exactly the, the, the goal of pilgrimage. The goal of pilgrimage is to get away from all the distractions. Now, there are different ways, but there are different ways to walk the Camino. There are all kinds of outfits turning a profit along the way by making the pilgrimage much easier. They arrange stops in larger towns with better hotels, you know, better than, than the hostels many pilgrims use along the way. Um, they carry your luggage in vans, so you can pack as much as you want because you're not going to carry it. They'll carry it for you. So no need to pare down. They use golf carts to zip along the trails um, to uh, carrying water, snacks, other refreshments. And if you get tired, the van will come and give you a lift to the next town. Now, I'm not necessarily criticizing all this. Uh, some, pilgrimage, some pilgrims may need some modifications due to things beyond their control. I, I couldn't walk the whole way of the Camino. No way. <laughs> I'd need some help. But taking the easier and more convenient way when you don't really need to rather misses the point of pilgrimage. The sacrifices a pilgrim is willing to make on the way and the sacrifices a pilgrim refuses to make are very revealing. It's the willingness or unwillingness to sacrifice that distinguishes a pilgrim from a tourist. Pilgrims and tourists both arrive at the cathedral but they arrive, I would say, in a very different state of mind and of spirit. Because it's in sacrifice that we find out something about ourselves and our relationship with God. Now, some of our youth and their adult chaperones are about to embark on a, pilgr uh, on a pilgrimage between July 3rd and July 9th. They're going on a mission trip to Rapid City, South Dakota, and they will make sacrifices too. They won't stay in nice hotels. They won't necessarily be eating their usual food, their preferred food and snacks. And it's understood that that's all part of the experience because they're not tourists, they're pilgrims. They'll be there to help and to learn from the lives of the people that they encounter through their immersion experience. They're willing to be changed by their experience. And they will also be putting God first and gaining perhaps a deeper understanding through those necessary sacrifices. The pilgrimage is a metaphor for the spiritual life Jesus walked the pilgrim way to Jerusalem to worship in the temple at Passover. But he didn't walk it as Israelites usually did. He didn't hate the people he was supposed to hate. Instead, Jesus walked in faithfulness to the Father. He didn't allow anything to distract him from it. And he didn't allow anyone to value anything higher than the Father not even the cultural practices that gave Jesus his earthly identity. 
and not even his life. Jesus was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, and so he is the model pilgrim. As Christians, we're called to walk the way of Christ, and that is the way of acceptance, compassion, and love. But the question for each of us is, how do we walk the pilgrim way of our life? Do we walk it as tourists, or do we walk it as pilgrims? Are we willing to take an honest look at what we value and how much we value it? And most of all, are we willing to be changed as we walk the Camino of life? But pilgrimage is not just drudgery and sacrifice. In the letter to the Galatians this morning, Paul tells his community to be guided by the Spirit. And in fact, it is the Holy Spirit who guides, who is our pilgrimage guide as we walk through life. And if we follow the Spirit, the, fru the fruits of the Spirit, which Paul names as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those gifts will grow in us and become a part of who we are. And as we walk our pilgrim way, we don't walk it alone. There is companionship to be found, community to be created, and deep joy to be experienced. On a dusty road in the middle of a hostile Middle Eastern country, some followers of Jesus asked him, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus turned to them and he rebuked them and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, they met another person and Jesus said to him, follow me. May our answer be an unqualified yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Please stand as you are able and let us profess our faith in the tradition of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all there is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the way of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially, and let's say together, Marcus, Richard, Bill, Lou, Peter, Peter, Lou, Lou Leslie, the, the Anderson, Anderson family, Sharon, Sharon Joan, Bob, Bob Randy, Randy, Matthew, Spencer, Spencer Reed, Reed, Vicki, Vicki Ken, Carol, Doug, Gail, and Jed. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your name. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Normally, we, or traditionally, we have been having the uh, announcements after the peace, but uh, the announcements have been moved to until after communion. I'll say a little bit more about it when we get there, okay? At this time of offering, let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
center of my life. I will always praise you. I will always serve you. I will always keep you in my sight. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God. center of my life. I will always praise you. I will always serve you. I will always keep you in my sight. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who even at night directs my shall stand firm. O Lord, you are the center of my life. I will always praise you. I will always serve you. I will always keep you in my sight. And so my heart rejoices, my soul is glad. stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, you creatures here below. Praise God above you, heavenly host. Faithful Son and Holy The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you made a, have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. 
You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory, giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in this world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with St. Martin of Tours and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Everyone is welcome at this holy table.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a few announcements. Good morning. Uh, so, um, I decided to move the announcements back to where they were in 2018. I looked back in your um, old worship bulletins. Um, I, I, my personal opinion is that having it after, um, you know, uh, just before the offertory breaks the flow of the liturgy. And uh, I've been in parishes that have, have had it in this position 
or before the service begins or where we were having it before the offertory. But I'd like to try this for a while and see how we do with it, see how it feels. Okay, so a um, couple of things here. Um, well, I'll leave the minor ones to, you know, the smaller ones to you. Um, but, I have, but I do have one big announcement. So, as part of our priest in charge process, um, we're asking for your input about parish life. Um, the job of the committee is to discern the future of St. Martin's, you know, where our next steps are. And of course, we, it is really important that we know everyone's, we have everyone's input, that we know what everyone is thinking and feeling. So, starting this Sunday and for the next five weeks, we are going to have a question of the week. <laughs> so, uh, what, what we have done is, you might notice on your announcement sheet, there is a little post-it note. And what we're asking people to do is to answer, I'm gonna make a few minutes here, or, and if that's not enough, you can finish it during coffee hour, to, at, to get your response to that question. The questions are based on what are our weaknesses, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are our, what are our opportunities, what are our challenges, you know, and then finally, um, I can't remember what the last question is right now. Anyway, why do you come to St. Martin's? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thor is one of the members of our, of our committee. So, what I'd like to ask you to do now is to write on, take your post-it, write uh, what, in your opinion, are the strengths of St. Martin, and, I'll, and when you're done with it, after the service, we're going to uh, attach them to a big piece of uh, newsprint that is on the window that says Paris Strengths. So this is anonymous, you don't sign your name to it. So, um, so what in your, um, what do you see as the strengths of St. Martin's? Give you a couple of minutes to, to, to do that now. Right, and if you need a pen, they're available too.
So if you're not finished, uh, you can take a few moments to uh, finish during coffee hour. And the newsprint is basically to your right as you leave, as you leave the, uh, the sanctuary this morning. Stuck to the window, says Parish Strengths. Okay. Uh, one final announcement. Um, uh, Melanie wants me to uh, uh, say that the t-shirts that she has ordered for folks are in. So please see her, um, yay, after, after, this, uh, uh, after the service is ended. Please stand. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please be seated. Sorry about that. Yeah, too many different things. Um, we have a vestry report to give. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's important. Hang on. Do you, let's, um, yeah, let's get you on a mic so that the people on the live stream. And before you do that, those of you who are uh, joining us on Facebook, um, you will have the opportunity to respond online, and we'll be putting out instructions about that um, in about a, in a day or so. Okay, we're going to be reaching out on all platforms. Okay, so the vestry did meet this past uh, Tuesday. Um, the meeting started with uh, Joanne taking mug shots of all of the uh, all of the <laughs> vestry members, presumably for the uh, new bulletin board, but I. Coincidentally, saw a new dartboard going up in the community life building in the youth youth group area, so I'm not sure exactly what the photos were for, but they did actually turn out quite nice. I liked mine, so um, we started the meeting. Uh, the vestry is undertaking collectively a course called Vestry 101. It's a, a program, a seven module program offered through Church Pension Group in the diocese, and we're doing it as an, an entire vestry. It's online, and, and we'll be completing those seven modules uh, over, uh, we started in June, we'll complete them through the end of the year. And the first module was really focused on uh, discernment, uh, particularly as it applies to vestry decision making and, and what uh, God's calling us to do as a vestry and as a parish, uh, so we'll be devoting probably 15 to 30 minutes of each of the next uh, several vestry meetings uh, to getting through that uh, discussion around that course. The vestry members are doing things online uh, all month long as part of that, uh, and then we kind of wrap up our discussions. In terms of uh, financial results, we did have a, a small deficit through the month of May, the uh, first five months, about 4600 We are about $7,400 ahead of plan, which is a good thing, so the deficits are running much less than what we anticipated. And while unfortunate, and we obviously the, the, the deficits are pose a challenge for us. I think I, I read that's upwards of about 40% of the parishes in the diocese are currently operating at some form of deficit, so it's something that's uh, fairly broad, uh, uh, broad across uh, the diocese at this point. Uh, income, pledge income, continues to run ahead of plan. Expenses are running a little less than plan, uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of helping us uh, along those lines. Um, Maryland reported on the uh, activities of the Priest in Charge Committee, which was formed in late April, early May. Obviously, our little activity here that we just did is an, an outcome of that. It all starts really, any process really starts with fact-finding uh, and understanding where you're at today. So that's, that's, that process will continue here for the next several weeks. Um, Melanie and Reverend Anna have been researching um, the idea of um, uh, holding bingo games, uh, both as a fundraiser and community engagement activity. Um, very early in the discussions, we found out that there's nothing preventing us from doing it, although there's a very long list of logistical things that we need to, uh, to deal with. Uh, so legal, diocese is okay, not too queasy, uh, but obviously things like hiring a game manager, having the right facilities, and those kinds of things. So we'll see if that, uh, if that comes about, but we have been discussing that uh, here the last couple of meetings. And then Marilyn uh, McDonald kicked off the... Um, uh, stewardship campaign. We have a, a committee that's in place from last year, although we're always looking for additional volunteers. Uh, I think we have a good game and plan in place for stewardship for this year. Uh, so if you're interested in, in participating in that, uh, please uh, contact Marilyn. And then lastly, we talked about uh, issue with tree trimming on the parish grounds. We have f five trees that are in need of either trimming or removal. Uh, in the process of getting bids, we found out that we have ash borer in those five trees. So now our only choice really is to take them all out. Uh, so we're getting bids to remove those five trees and grind stumps. 
Uh, so, you know, financially that could be upwards of about $4,800 for the five trees. Uh, so obviously we'll need to address that in light of our, our current uh, deficit position. But uh, anyway, that was the last, last item. So we'll wrap up the bids here uh, for the trees and then uh, Vestry will make a decision about how we want to proceed with that. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. And now, for real, will you please stand? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, our our 41st wedding anniversary is tomorrow. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. You think I'm worth keeping? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. You're worth keeping too. Thank you. The flowers look good. Yep. Thank you, everyone. And we also wish a happy anniversary to Bill and Candace Eldred, whose anniversary is the day after ours. So, final blessing. May the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Christ, there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In Christ shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is surely kin to be. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that was a lot.